All right, so um, welcome everybody. First off, my name is Dan Cronin. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture here at University of Idaho. Um, I teach a lot of different things in terms of site scale, uh, stormwater management, uh, construction, grading and drainage, and then also design studios where we work at the site scale, but also I work at the landscape scale, landscape planning, which I do for research projects with the Center for Resilient Communities, uh, which is an on uh, campus research hub where we're focusing on scenario planning and how things could change under the assumptions of climate change, under the assumptions of um, uh, it's increased population and a lot of these different factors. So we plan this out through scenarios. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but the purpose of today's workshop is essentially to cover art pro basics and to show how that's vetted with a lot of projects that are currently running. Um, so just as a kind of a litmus real quick, does anyone have experience with ArcMap? Cool, so that's more than half. Is anybody a complete beginner? Okay, so that's completely fine. Um, I'll kind of show you how it's um, in, how it's nested inside of, um, how we use it in geography and in landscape architecture and also in practice. Um, so that's something that in research, I commonly use it a lot in practice as a landscape architect. Um, I've also used it quite a bit as well. So I'll kind of show you um, how it's used there and we'll talk about uh, the utility of Art Pro itself as a tool. Then we'll cover some, basic concepts about how you can use the same tools, basic raster and vector tools from ArcMap inside of ArcPro, and then some new cool stuff that um, ArcPro, that Esri's doing and using ArcPro with R4. Um, let's see, so to start off with, any, any questions right off the bat? Awesome, okay, so let's go ahead and let's get started. I'll, I'll run through a quick bit of slides. So again, um, welcome everybody, I'm happy to, um, to give this workshop with you and then also um, thank you guys for putting this on. It's been really, really useful um, for me as well. Okay, so we'll just cover some Art Pro basics and then we'll also talk about how to get set up and then navigation as well. Okay, one of my favorite in images about GIS essentially, the way that we use it as planners, as landscape architects and geographers as well, is to look at various layers, right? Um, and how they're analyzed together um, mutually exclusive or inclusive, right? So we use a wide array of different tools to figure that out, to use that and understand the statistics about how that's, how these um, essentially layers are overlapping. And we'll just look at a few today to mock up. So what that looks like, and specifically to get more spatial, you have um, you know, particular stakeholder assumptions in three, or actually four different data types that we'll talk about here in a second, to come up with raster and vector data for things like elevation or land use, streets, um, you know, policy decisions, actors, right, or, or particular people that make policy changes uh, or decisions on the landscape uh, itself. Um, and then the composite, right, what that looks like as an image uh, squished together and then um, essentially a combination of all those particular layers together. Um, let's see, so what that looks like in terms of um, data is essentially different data, data layers that you can add together or use different modes of searching to figure out uh, where the overlaps are, okay? Where those two things geospatially connect to make assumptions of if there's something to be um, uh, planned for that particular area or something not. So for example, whenever you're citing um, um, a new development, Okay, which we commonly do as landscape architects, um, or even civil engineers do it as, as well. You wanna make sure that you're understanding where uh, sewer lines are going. Sewer lines are essentially the most expensive piece of infrastructure, and then also, to take, so taking that data layer and then overlaying that essentially with available land is a way that you can find a suitable location. Right? So the more layers, the more data that, that you have, um, the more that you have to understand how that's weighted in value to make assumptions about where specifically you can put something, you can place something, or you can cite something. Um, let's see, so you can do that with different, or three different uh, data types, or actually four, we'll talk about three for uh, the, to, begin out, to begin with, and then we'll talk about the last one. 
Um, you think that, you know, as far as we've come with technology and with science, there would be more data types than this. This is essentially what we're still dealing with. Uh, point data, line data, polygon data, and grid data. Um, so grid data is essentially rasters. Is this, is this familiar with everybody? Okay, good. Okay. So um, that's good that I'm preaching to the choir. Sometimes there's um, some complete beginners with these kind of workshops, and that's completely fine as well. But uh, point, line, polygon, and then also raster data um, are used to make assumptions about where suitable locations can be planned or assumptions about how the landscape can change over time, right, or with different uh, um, kind of analysis processes. Uh, processes. So uh, you can associate values with each of these data types to say um, those specifically are geospatial and there's also an attribute associated with it, okay? It's a little bit different, and I think all of you know this, with uh, polygon data versus raster data, right? So you can load a lot of information with polygon data, and then you're kind of limited with raster data because that's essentially pixels that you can associate a particular value with these, okay? And we'll talk about what that looks like a little later. Okay, so um, let's come back to this for suitability analysis, but essentially, um, but or just to talk about it briefly for now, you can essentially take raster data um, and overlay that on top of each other in a set of layers and create a composite map where you have um, suitable, highly suitable, right, versus things that are restricted or not so suitable, okay? So for each one of these values, you can associate different numbers in terms of slope aspect, right? To say this particular slope is suitable in some locations for a planned community or a type of vegetation or that uh, versus a road or a road network to say there's a buffer around this particular stream even uh, that where it's going to be more suitable for development or, or not. Uh, the same thing with elevation, right? So elevation change in terms of if you're looking for uh, a particular habitat type for a, a, that's suitable for one, you know, um, plant, right? Or, or, or particular stand of trees or um, habitat kind of con connection for uh, you know, different types of species. That's something that you can associate a value with. Higher values being um, more suitable, lower values being not, or vice versa. And then the same thing for slope, saying that slopes are um, um, higher, they're gonna be more suitable or less suitable. You can, in um, long story short, you can take those different values, assign numbers to them, and add those together add all of those numbers together to come up with a composite map to tell you if something is highly suitable or not suitable or restricted. <coughs> so if these are all, you know, ones, right, for being highly suitable, you add those together, the highly suitable ones are gonna be four here. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, something that's a zero wouldn't, be equate, wouldn't add up in the equation. So that's gonna produce a ranking order. Okay. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to multiply. Right, that's going to give you a binary map, right, with ones and zeros. So you can say it's a yes/no question, or it's a rank order kind of suitability. We'll we'll talk about that a little bit later whenever we get into pro, and then also uh, measuring suitability. Okay, so let's let's uh, jump right into it. I think everybody's ready to open up pro. Um, has anybody opened up pro before? So kind of one of those things like you're like sh should I hit the button or not, and then when you open it up, it's Whoa, what just happened? Table slipping over, you know, kids are crying, people are in, in chaos, but it's not that bad. Essentially, what it is is just um, a user face kind of difference from our map. Okay? And you can do some pretty cool stuff in it. Um, so what I'll what we'll do is um, is anyone a Mac person? Okay. Okay, um, nothing against Mac, people who like Mac, but sometimes I have to explain how Cortana works. And that can be a little um, strange. Um, okay, so in, this, in the search bar, go ahead and just type in Arc Pro. ArcGIS Pro. Just go ahead and type that in for now. Okay. Oh, and if you're get, if you're prompted to uh, um, UI Idaho kind of log in from Esri, go to 
an enterprise login, except for the people who uh, need to log in. Oh, okay. need to log in. So you guys will take an UI Yep. In that second. Oh, and then underneath this. If we have another Yeah, you are. There's going to be some difference. Okay, so what do you have? Use this. And those of you that are on the digital side, uh, you'll go to um, when, whenever you, this op the screen opens up, it's going to prompt you to go to uh, enterprise or your own personal login. Go to the enterprise login and then type in UIDAHO. Let me know if you have any questions about that. All right, everybody's good to go. Is everybody more or less looking at the same um, same screen here? Your, your your interface is probably white or light colored, and I'll show you how to change that if you prefer the kind of dark or the look. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go to create a new project underneath that. Just go to blank, select blank there. Underneath this, it's going to prompt you to create a new project. And what this does, it creates a geo database and then also a folder to save it. So it's um, really, really useful. And you can, with a geo database, you can have all of your raster uh, data, vector data um, on the same projection, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with geo databases, but it's really useful to stay consistent with your data. Um, so what you can do there is you'll have this tick box selected with the name of the project. I'm just going to call this Arc Pro, Arc GIS Pro Basics. Um, you don't have to worry about spaces. That's completely fine for the name. Uh, the location of the pathway, you should make sure that does not have spaces. And then I'll, I'll select create a new folder for that. And go ahead and hit OK there. That's going to create a new project. You can save that to the desktop or if you have a thumb drive or if you're working on your own machine uh, or a remote server, if you're doing it that way, that's completely fine. Okay, so this interface will pop up to begin with. Um, it's sort of set up the same way as um, a lot of ArcMap programs, but also the newer programs like, for example, if anybody's familiar with drafting uh, or AutoCAD or Revit or these programs, you have kind of this top ribbon up here where you can actually um, undo things. You can also save and open new projects here. Um, and then also in this particular project you have, or this folder, you have control new to open up things. So it also has the associated uh, shortcut there. Um, underneath project, click on that. The project tab, and I'll go back to it. Click on that. Underneath the project tab, you have options. And you can click on that. It'll select this particular folder. Oops. I'm going to blame that on a 
on the room. <laughs> and then uh, um, underneath this, you can go to display. Uh, I think that's under general, excuse me. So application, general, and then you can personalize uh, the theme to light to dark if you want. Um, I'm just gonna leave mine to dark. Um, you will have to reset, if you change it from light to dark, you will have to reset the, the entire program and start over again. Um, so, so you may not wanna do that for now. Okay, so that's where that, that particular uh, function lives. Okay, so the next thing that you can do is, or that we'll talk about is general navigation and what this looks like and the, the, the similarities between this and ArcMap. So essentially you have the contents pane, okay? This contents pane is um, close to your, your attribute layers, all of your different layers associated with our, an art map project. Um, and you also have um, a catalog tab if you wanna use that. A lot of the work lives here. Okay? And then you also have the catalog tab, uh, our pane off to the side. Uh, so just like with art map, um, you can use geoprocessing, your toolboxes, symbology, all those things off to this particular pane, your catalog or your, um, your art, art map pane. So what we'll, we'll do here is go to the home tab. And this will make more sense about how to copy and paste and edit particular layers underneath this. And then flip over to the insert tab there. That's the second from the left. And you'll see new map, new layout, import map, all of these things, toolbox, all of these things that are uh, going to be useful for us today. What we'll do now is we'll just go to new map and go ahead and click that once. And that's going to create a new map tab okay, in, Arc, in, in Arc itself. Cool, so you, you have this set up and you can also navigate with this particular map. You can zoom into this particular extent. Um, and then something that's really interesting about uh, the newer version, which I, I think are, is not on our machines, but you can go to a specific um, lat long uh, site or X, X and Y coordinate. So that's a tool function for uh, the new Arc Pro, which is not on these machines, but it's uh, one tool that pops up that says, go to X and Y, go to X and Y coordinate. That's on the newest version of Arc, Arc Pro. Uh, but for today, what we'll do is we're just gonna walk through um, what this looks like in terms of um, how to set up things. Okay, so we essentially have a base map. We can go ahead and change that base map if we want to use something more like an aerial. So underneath that, you can click on base map. Um, I'm gonna use the dark canvas for today. Uh, you can use, feel free to use the aerial. That's completely fine. Okay. So you have the contents pane, your map, and you can also create layouts in this particular pane as well, um, which is pretty interesting. So say, for example, if you go to insert, um, you can create a layout here. We'll, we'll work through that a little bit later in the, um, in the workshop. But for now, we'll just we'll talk about the map itself. Okay, just like our catalog, you have to connect to a folder and we'll talk about where to, um, or what data you can use for, for today just to walk through the workshop. Okay, so go ahead and flip to Chrome for now. Uh, or you can type in Cortana, just type in Chrome there, or Google Chrome. And then go to this website, it's insideidaho.org. Okay. Um, Inside Idaho, it's um, essentially a repository for a lot of Idaho-driven data that uh, in-house the library and um, has produced for um, a lot of the data that we hold and use with the university itself. Uh, data mining, as you probably all know, there's a lot of different places to, to access data and to download different data types. I've put a few on the board, and the, those that are uh, connecting via Zoom, I'll send out some of these links a little bit later today if you're interested. But you have Inside Idaho for Idaho data specifically, Earth Explorer for your DEMs and elevation data, of DM slash elevation data, it's almost essentially the same. Those are typically rasters, right? Um, data gateway, nrcs.usda.gov. That's a lot of your tax lot data. Um, that can be roads, stream data, NHD. Um, I, I believe there's even ESA data or Endangered Species Act data inside of that. Um, really powerful stuff. 
You also have access to um, Sergo data or soils data for those of you that are interested in soil sciences um, uh, or restrictive features, depth of bedrock, all that stuff is inside of there. Um, there's also the web soil survey. Um, uh, I'll talk about that for a second. Really easy to access and to utilize this data um, inside of here. And then um, we also have you uh, or inside Idaho that we'll use for today. So underneath the inside Idaho tab, oh, excuse me, the last one, mrlc.gov, which is land cover or NLCD uh, data, national land cover data set, if any of you are interested in those, those particular data types. Um, underneath inside Idaho, we'll go to uh, the popular data. Okay, and that's gonna pull up these particular data sets and tabs. Um, underneath structures, underneath that tab structures, go ahead and click on that. Okay. And then underneath this, let's go to the Esri shape file. Let's click on that and that's gonna prompt a download. Is, it, is anybody who is not there? What's that? Which one is the Oh, that's the yeah, the lower one that says map layers for the University of Idaho main campus. And we'll use the Esri shape file, the dot uh, SHP file. And that's gonna prompt a download for this Moscow, um, I, I believe it's titled Moscow.zip file. Um, we use 7-zip with this university, so I'll show you how to extract using that. Uh, who is not there? I know, I know you just walked in, but we'll, we'll get you caught up. Um, okay, so go ahead and uh, select that, click on that, go to show and folder. Sele uh, select that, that arrow, uh, and then it's gonna say show and folder. Right click on your zipped Moscow file. And then go to 7-zip, okay, just hover over that, and I'll leave it up on the screen to show you what that looks like. And then go to extract here, select that, and that's gonna put it in, a, uh, in that downloads folder. You can copy that folder over to your, um, to your desktop, you can put that wherever that's, wherever that is useful. Um, I already have it downloaded, but I'll just go ahead and let it run. Um, let's see. So the other thing that you can do is you can also extract here, or you can do extract location to a location. You can extract it to the desktop. Cool. Okay, so I have mine set to the desktop. Um, and let's go ahead and let's, um, let's do that to the desktop instead. Sorry for that. I'll right click, I'll go to 7-zip, and I'll do extract files. It should say extract to there. Set that directly to the desktop. That's gonna be a lot easier for us. So I'll leave that accordion open. So, so once again, I'll just go over it because I went through that pretty quickly. Right click on that 7-zip folder, 7-zip, extract files, not extract here extract files, click on that three, the three dots all the way to the right. Okay, click on that, and then click on desktop here. That's gonna prompt me to, to um, unzip this file to that particular location at the folder level. So just click on desktop. Okay, then you'll hit okay, that's gonna extract it, hit okay again, and that's gonna um, extract that particular file. Uh, please raise your hand if you're not there. So we got that set up, we got that good to go. Now let's go ahead and we'll flip back to our pro. Um, also, who is not there? Everybody's got it extracted? Okay, cool. Um, let's go back to our pro. 
And then let's go ahead and let's map this folder to connect to our desktop to that specifically to, at the folder level to that Moscow folder. So underneath folders, you can see that you have, if you click at, um, to open up that accordion, underneath folders in the art, in the catalog pane, if you click on that, you can see specifically uh, you have that file that you created. It should say, or if you li labeled it different, but mine says ArcGIS Pro Basics uh, for the name of the workshop. At the folder level where it says folders, right click there and go to add folder connection. Now, underneath that Add Folder Connection, click on the desktop. And then at the folder level, just click on Moscow, where you have extracted that file. Go ahead and click OK. And then now, with the, if you open up the accordion, you should have these particular data layers. Does everybody see that? Please raise your hand if you don't see those data layers uh, connected with the catalog. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so what we're gonna do for now, let's, let's just walk through a little bit about how you would use this type of data. So what we're gonna do is we have, we've changed the base map, so we're good to go there. Uh, we've talked about this. Let's talk about processing tabs, how to access tools. Uh, so right now we have the catalog t uh, tab. You also have portal okay, underneath that, which is incredibly useful. So um, if you click over from uh, project to portal, this is a new function inside of uh, Art Pro that makes it, that separates it from Art Map. You have um, access to what's called the Living Atlas. Okay, weird kind of creepy name, <laughs> but um, Ezra's good at doing stuff like that. But at the same token, you have some pretty interesting functionality with the Living Atlas. This is a live um, repository to data that you can uh, upload uh, directly to your directly to your project, vector and raster, raster data. We'll, we'll demo that a little bit later in, in the workshop. Incredibly useful, incredibly um, interesting because it's all live. Um, so for, just for now, let's click back on project uh, at the at that particular pane. And let's go ahead and um, let's show you where geoprocessing lives. So underneath analysis, the analysis tab at the top, uh, go to tools, just click on tools once. So underneath that, it's if you click on that particular tool, uh, that toolbox once, that's gonna create a tab at the bottom. So this is another function that's changed in terms of navigation for Art Pro, is you can switch back and forth from your catalog view to geoprocessing really easily, okay? Geoprocessing is essentially ARC, um, ARC tools. It's your toolbox that you can, you can find specific raster and vector tools underneath that. Um, I prefer the search, okay? Um, but if you're used to kind of the toolbox setup, you can click underneath, instead of going to favorites, you can go to tools and you can search through analysis tools um, or for example, conversion tools or data management tools, kind of the common ones that are typically used. Um, I prefer to go to favorites. You can also um, see the functionality with Portal, where you can have these ready-to-use tool sets. Like, for example, those of you who are, um, use these use ArcGIS for hydrology or hydrologic analysis or hydromodification. That's a quick one that you can find through the Portal under geoprocessing. Um, okay, so we have that set up. Uh, let's go ahead and let's um, let's start to bring in some of your data. It's uh, drag and drop. I believe it was the same in ArcMap, uh, if I remember correctly. But what we'll do is we'll go back to the catalog tab underneath that, that particular catalog pane, and we'll go to land use Moscow UIFs dot shape. Go ahead and just drag that in. The other way to do that is you can right click and go to um, add to current map. Okay. Um, so we have that set up. What we're gonna do now is we, we're gonna just show you a little bit of the functionality if you wanted to change the symbology. So if you remember from mark map, you had to go through a lot of steps to change the transparent 
transparency. You had to go through a lot of um, grief, right, to change the symbols in terms of if you wanted to create unique features. All you have to do here is right click and go to symbology. Right click on that layer, go to symbology. And you, you, this will pop up again in that pane. So all this is kind of like your one stop shop for your catalog, geo processing, and then also uh, the symbology. So you can have a single symbol. If you, if you select that single, single symbol um, kind of arrow there, you can have unique features, graduated colors, um, and then also graduated symbols. You can have these as classified. Um, I'm just gonna use for today unique values. We use these as unique values. I don't wanna arrange for this particular uh, data set that I have. Um, and raise your hand if you're not there. Raise your hand if you need a little bit of help. Cool, everybody's, yes. I just had a more question. So can you still access the model from the way you would at ArcMap, or is it, is it, is this the, uh, it, th so that's one of the many ways. It's kind of um, pretty interesting the way it's set up because you can also do it through, um, is it appearance? I believe it's appearance as well. Yeah, if you, if you go to appearance there, that appearance tab at the top, you can also access it through this. Okay? And that's going to set it up to where you're dealing with that new symbology tab. It'll just open it up. Um, so to, I guess to answer your question, it's a little different. It's a little, it's not clunkier, they're just trying to streamline it to one place, right, on that, on that interface to, to access. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to unique features in my, in my symbology tab. And I'm just gonna change this field value for unique features, I'm gonna change that to the use type, okay, for this land use, um, or excuse me, zoning type. And I'll change, I'll select the uh, use type to where all of these colors, these, um, Easter m and colored color scheme that's showing up here. That's all set up to have different land use types in terms of academic, agriculture, uh, auxiliary, commercial, open space, and residential. Okay, so we have that set up for particular use types. Um, similar to ARC, um, um, ARC map, you can also change the, the um, excuse me, the transparency or the opacity, but that's a little bit easier and quicker uh, inside of Arc Pro. It's just under the appearance tab and you can just change this. Uh, my go-to is usually around um, 40%. So you can still see kind of like what's behind it. Um, for this one, these colors, I'll just use uh, 60. Okay, I lied, 50, 55, okay. So I got that set up, I can change the symbology here. Um, I can also just, similar to ArcMap, you can actually select these particular layers and change the symbology there as well, okay? So you have your gallery tab that will open up in the symbology. If you, for example, if you just double click on that polygon uh, for, say for example, for, um, for academic, right? If I double click there, this pane will show up without a uh, gallery. Um, and then also properties. I can change specifically like the outline color if I don't want an outline for that particular unit. Um, I can turn that off and make that no color. Um, and it's that same kind of color palette that you're dealing with with Arc Map there. The outline width, I can also change that as well um, and kind of navigate through that if I want pretty, pretty easily. Um, so a little bit of, it's a little bit of difference from um, Arc Map, but it's essentially still in the same um, a lot of things are still in the same place, or near to. Uh, the other thing is if you're looking for projections, um, you can also right click on that layer. You can right click on that layer and go to properties down here. Underneath properties, you have the source tab. Layer properties, you have the source tab. That's gonna give you the data source, the extent, right? And also the spatial reference. Um, so that's you know a whole other thing in terms of what we use for projections, but I think everybody's probably familiar with this group. Everybody's probably familiar with projections. The other thing that's important is make sh making sure that it's consistent all throughout the project, as you probably know. You can do that with your geo database. If you're not familiar with geo databases, you can set that geo database to a particular projection. Uh, for this one, I have it set to 1983 um, State Plain, Idaho, Phipps West. 
Um, let's see. So the other thing that's um, I'm still I'm still learning, you know, new functionality with Art Pro as well. But there's, you know, when you have a project site kind of sorted out, you figure out your project site. It's probably more than plausible that there's two state planes right next to that, right? It's on your 11 in and also the 10 in. It always just happens when you're dealing with projects because like it's, it's, it knows it's you, right? So there's a way that um, you can retrofit those two together inside of Art Pro. I haven't totally figured that out yet, but uh, for the next workshop, I definitely will. Um, so that's one thing that Art Map can um, automatically do. We're in Whereas in um, Arc, oh, excuse me, Arc Pro can do in Arc Map, you had to run through a series of steps to make sure that those were merged together. And um, um, let's see, so you got this set up, you got this good to go. Um, let's just go through a few of the basic tools that you've probably used Arc Map to 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 run through for searching, uh, searching for attributes. We're going to do that essentially with Arc Pro and show you kind of the sim, uh, similarities. So underneath the the Map tab. Underneath the map tab at the top ribbon there, um, you also have select underneath this and underneath that tool ribbon. So you have explore, bookmarks, base map, add data here, uh, add presets, and then right next to that, you have the select tab. You can use the rectangle, uh, you can use lasso, you know, kind of whatever is useful for that, and that's gonna give you a, um, a chance to select this particular data. Um, probably what you're waiting for for is to hear about attribute data and how to open up an attribute data set that's associated with this particular data um, data layer. Uh, same thing as it was with ArcMap, you'll right click on that particular layer, click on attribute tables, set up a little bit different, and it looks a little clunky and a little daunting, um, but essentially it's a lot more efficient, in my opinion, than the way that ArcMap was set up. The attribute table at the bottom, it's really easy to clear your selections, to add fields, to do all of these different kind of things uh, for that particular um, uh, data. Uh, so case in point, for example, with this attribute table open, what we'll do is we're going to uh, go ahead and calculate this geometry. So at that top level under polygon area, you can right click and um, if it's not showing up with calculate field, that's a version issue. Okay? The newest version will have calculate geometry. The other way to get to that you can the other way to do that is with uh, if, you, if that's not showing up in that particular polygon area, what you'll do is under geoprocessing, You'll click on that, and I usually, like, I prefer the search. I usually prefer the search, but you'll type in add geometry attributes. Okay. Add geometry attributes. That's going to be under the data management tools. Um, let's see. The other thing that's kind of interesting, and this, these are just these small quirks that I've noticed in between ArcMap and Arc Pro. But you, you know, in ArcMap, you had to type in exactly, you know, letter for letter, space for space, what it is in Arc in ArcMap. Whereas this, you can just start typing it in and it'll read it right away. Um, so I'll just go ahead and click on Add Geometry Attributes. That tool is going to uh, prompt you to this, where you can have your input features, um, and I'll do that for the land use Moscow UIFs. I'll set my geometry properties just for area there. Okay. And I'll use the, un uh, the length unit. I'm going to put that in feet. Okay. The area unit, I'll put that in acres. And then for the coordinate system, just like with ArcMap, you can import those particular um, uh, coordinates and set those for that, pr that particular projection. So I'm going to use uh, the same one as my land use Moscow uh, UIS. So that's going to pop up with that um, that state plane, that Idaho state plane projection. Um, does everybody see that? Is anybody missing this kind of? Let's, 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 let's take a, a, a short break. A bench retired here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Let's, let's just do that. Okay, so is it, who has not seen the poly area category? Perfect. Okay, so that's um, not perfect, but we'll get you all sorted out. So what we'll do here is we're going to add another column, right? We're going to add another column. And um, it's actually a good learning point because we'll show you how easy this is to do. Underneath that attribute table, if you're not seeing poly area, go to add there. Click on add. Okay. And this is this is the the art pro way to add a particular tab or uh, column to this. It's going to pop up here. You know, the first thing that you'll see um, underneath that attribute table. Well, let's get you all caught up with the attribute. Table. Click on add. There. Okay. Uh, go ahead and type in instead of poly area. Go ahead and type in area acres. Um, you can set this to a double or a long. It's, it's kind of up to you at this point. Um, let's see. I'm just going to set that by, and then I'll also click or double click on the number format. I'll click on these three boxes, or these three dots here. Underneath that category, click on numeric. Click on numeric. And go ahead and hit OK. Raise your hand if you're, if you're not there, if you're kind of struggling with that kind of How is this different than doing the add geometry attribute? Uh, so the add geometry is like it, calculate, it calculates that particular field. This, oh, this one's just adding in a just new adding a column. Okay. Adding a new column category. I don't know if this column is actually added here. Um, the calculate geometry? Mm, probably not. It did for me. It did? For me, when I hit front on that. Perfect. 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 So uh, I'd say one or two, we just walked through two different tools or two different types really quickly, but that's the way to add a new column. If you wanted to calculate geometry, you would just go to save here. Okay. So that's one quick way to do it. The other way to do it is um, if you just hit run here with the add geometry attributes tool, that's going to execute that particular tool. That's going to run it for you. You know, I have that. I have that option. But then, how did you get back and change the add geometry? Oh, so that's under geo process. Let's see what you said. Go go resources. And then you can the add geometry. Oh. Yeah. 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 Sorry for that. I didn't realize that it created a whole other task. So I just learned something new. Raise your hand if you're not there. If you're if you're struggling with that part. When you say yes, say you're referring to the top left. You're the same. Oh no! no, no sorry. This. Oh okay. So that if you see that there, that's going to create that another tool that doesn't exist. So you you X out of this one. Now you're going to.
So, yeah. Hmm. It's not, yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, I think everybody's more or less caught up. Sorry for that uh, quick uh, hiccup there. But that's going to give you um, a way to add in that particular category. So, this is um, a little bit different about the attribute table or the fields. The fields for adding a new field will pop up there. Uh, and then also it pops up here. So that polygon area is gonna show up with that area acres. Um, the newer versions are gonna pop up with a calculate geometry, similar to ArcMap, right? The newer versions have that. So that's a different function from the older uh, Arc Pro versions versus the newer. Does that make sense? So instead of going to the add geometry attributes as a tool, you can just add in uh, or go to calculate geometry. What's that? Uh, calculate field is, is uh, like you're adding in, if, for example, if you wanted to add in text specific for one selection, that's where calculate field is going to be. But calculate geometry, that's going to give you the measurement, the units uh, of what you want. Exactly. But you can't do that in this version. With, this, with the older version, no. But I, I believe it's 2.2. That's, that's the one where you can do, uh, you can specifically use the calculate geometry. Does that, does that make sense? Is there calculated geometry in, in this table for that field? But for that field, maybe your versions have it. This machine has it, but this machine or, or desktop. Is there a required update? Yeah, with, with version 2.2. Oh, with the university? Um, they should. It, that's the weird thing is some machines have them. Like in McClure, it works, but in these, in the admin building, it doesn't. In the oh. library, it works, but. Um, let's see. So we got that sorted out. Okay, so that's the selection. Sorry, that was kind of like scratching your ear, your left ear with your right hand. I apologize for that. Um, let's go ahead and let's go to the selection mode. So select by attributes from there. Um, and let's just select only the open space. Let's only select the open space for this one. If you go to, if you click on the open space here, that's going to be a little bit different than the normal SQL language that you would commonly use for searching. Has, it, has anyone used that before? SQL? The, it's essentially the same as Boolean logic. Um, but what you'll do here is I'm just going to have the layer name or view. That's going to be land use, Moscow, UIS, the selection type. Um, this is something that's really, it's, it's similar to art map, but you had to, go through a lot of steps to get to where in pro you can add to a new selection uh, you can have just a new selection you can remove from a selection or clear it so I'm just going to use the new selection there and I can click add a clause to this if you add a clause that's going to give you that particular um, SQL kind of format so with that I'm going to put in my um, instead of FID I'm just going to use use type and I also have kind of the same thing. Instead of using those, um, you know, the characters, it says in, in plain English is equal to, does not equal, begins with, uh, yada, yada. Greater than or equals to if you're dealing with something that's numeric. And it'll spell it out for you rather than the symbols. Um, I don't know why they made that change, but it's kind of interesting. So you have use type is equal to, and I'm going to set this to um, open space. I'm just going to set that to open space. And uh, I don't have to add, if I want to add, add I can. Uh, for example, if I wanted to modify or to this, I can put in another clause on top of that, like an and or statement. So for example, if I have and, I can use um, area acres or polygon area, which way, whichever one's at, uh, added inside of that. And I can make it is greater than or equal to a particular unit. Like, for example, I'll use 20 acres, for example, um, if I can ever get to it. <laughs> See, I'll just use this 20. Or actually, I'll just type it in. Okay. I'm going to add that in, 
And now both of these, these particular clauses are set up and I can hit run. And that's gonna run the selection for what those area acres uh, that are over, that are open space and also over 20 acres are gonna create. Or, or what they're going to look like. For example, if I did, if I wanted to get rid of that, any, if I just want to select everything that's um, um, all of the open space in that particular use type, I can remove that clause by just selecting that X, um, or I can edit the clause using that, and I'll hit the Run button again. Now we can select all the open space. Now we can select all the open space. So kind of similar to ArcMap, but there's a few differences. Uh, let's do one more selection type. So I'm just going to remove that clause. And I'm going to just go ahead and click on Add Clause to begin another type of selection. I'll do, um, let's see, because not everybody has uh, poly, uh, the area acres calculated. So let's not use that. Let's just use use, use type here. I'll do is equal to. And let's look at all the, um, the residential that's close to campus. Okay. And I'll do an add there. And then I'll do a run. Okay. And I can see that that's going to pop up also in my attribute field, uh, in my attribute table. Similar to arc map at the bottom here, you can go to the show selected uh, records and you can click on that. And that's going to um, show those particular selected layers for that. If you wanted to summarize all of these to find out all of the residential in Moscow are in that are in our study area. That is uh, um, the total acres essentially, or the statistics. Statistics at the tab level, all the way at the top, top. You'll go to summarize, and that'll summarize the table, and that's going to give you the summary statistics uh, for the entire poly or the entire set of polygons. Sorry, where is that again? Oh, sure. So at the tab level, like up here. Oh, that's like Correct. You'll right click and then go to summarize and that'll give you some information about that. Uh, you can run the summary statistics themselves to calculate what that poly polygon area is going to look like. We won't worry about that for to today. We're just going to have this, uh, this selection made. Okay, so for creating new data, if you wanted to create new data from that selection, which um, everybody's familiar with that concept, just to cover what that does, that creates a selection and it'll create a whole new sheet file that you can use later on. Um, so the way that you can do that, um, let's first change our selection. Let's go back to it. Let's change our selection to, and I'm just gonna clear the selection for now. Let's go ahead and let's select everything that's agriculture in that particular site, everything that's agriculture. So I'll do that by going to select by attributes, new selection, and I'm going to use a new selection there. Add a clause, land use type, our use type is there, is equal to, and everything that's agriculture. And I'll just go ahead and hit run, and that's going to select, uh, after hitting add, excuse me, I'll hit run, and that's going to select everything that's agriculture. Okay. So that's now selected. We have that as a selected unit. I'll right click on my, on my data layer there. Okay. And I'll go down to data. And I, from here I can go to export features. Okay. And that's essentially um, the same way, our, I think our, our maps terminology was create data or create data layer, something like that. Yeah. Export data. This one is just export export features, okay? So that's everything that you have selected. Uh, it's gonna create that as a data layer. So if I right click there, um, I can create this, I can give, I have the input for that selection, and then I also have the output feature. I'm just gonna call this Moscow Ag. Um, and then, I, you know, I think everybody in this crowd knows this, but you, um, for shape files, don't use gaps. They can be kind of like up to, I think, it's up to 20 characters for shape files. For raster files, all lowercase, no spaces, up to 13 characters. Up to 13 characters. Um, and I, no crazy symbols either. That's kind of the bummer about it. Um, so I'm just going to call that Moscow underscore um, ag. Okay. 
Okay. And then I'll just run that tool. That's going to export that to my particular project. And then the interesting about thing about this, you can set your environments. For those of you who are familiar with setting environments, you can dictate where these files are going to go to, what projection it's going to be, um, or automatically it'll save it to your geo database that's created in the file. Okay, so that created a whole nother layer for that. I think we're good to go there. Now we have this layer. I'm just going to turn off the other one for now. So I have this set up uh, as such. Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay, um, so we got selection set up. Um, let's go ahead and let's, we have that new data created. Um, I think everyone's created data before. Uh, if not, congratulations and happy Halloween. You created data. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and let's go back to our geo processing um, in that tab. And you have essentially all of these different tools that we can run. We're gonna run a buffer tool. Let's not use that for this specific data set. Let's do that for a line feature. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is underneath catalog, go back to the catalog tab underneath the catalog pane. And what we'll do there is let's go ahead and let's bring in the stream buffer. So that's going to be Paradise Creek Moscow UIS shapefile. So Paradise Creek. So we got that one sorted out. Let's turn off that Moscow layer, that Moscow Ag layer. Um, and also, if you're if you're dealing with selection, just similar to Arc Map, you can also do that from the the data source level. Uh, also, you can control which ones can be selectable <laughs> from these tabs at the top underneath the contents pane. Um, I generally work, work in list by drawing order, but if you have a different preference, that's kind of where you can control that. Um, so just underneath the, the contents pane under drawing list by drawing order, I have Paradise Creek underscore Moscow underscore UIS. I have that set up. Let's go ahead and let's uh, open up the attribute table to see what that data looks like. You have essentially uh, the length and then the area, the name of that particular creek or that set of um, um, hydrology. And then let's go ahead and let's change the symbology to something annoying so it stands out on top of this uh, this particular dark background. So I'm going to change that appearance instead of this um, kind of mucky brown color. I'm going to change that to something very annoying, like my favorite color, a barragon or a fuchsia pink. There we go. Uh, I'm not even kidding. This really is my favorite color. So I have that set up. Um, it's good to go. Now I'm going to go ahead and run a buffer for that particular stream. Okay. Similar to Buffer Wizard, that's the sad thing about losing or switching over to Arc Pro. Pro, his buffer wizard is gone. I know everybody kind of you had a soft spot in your heart for buffer wizard, but can no longer use it. A bummer, right? Um, let's go ahead and let's just use the buffer. It's a little bit easier than buffer wizard. It's harder to put rings on things, but uh, let's go ahead and go to geo processing under the geo processing tab. Okay. And let's type in buffer, just buffer. And underneath the analysis tools, click in buffer there. 
And then for the input features, I'm going to use that Paradise Creek Moscow UIS. Okay. Output feature class, um, I'm going to erase everything there. I'm going to give it a shorter title. It's something that I can remember. So I'm just going to call this Paradise Creek or PC underscore buff. And I'll put this at, let's, let's see what 150 feet does. So we're going to create a 150 foot buffer. Um, and that's something that in, in the sciences, as you probably all know, that's um, a stream buffer for an impart to have a buffer around an impacted stream. That's a best management practice to make sure any runoff from agriculture, um, any runoff from a parking lot isn't going to impair that stream. 150 feet. Where that comes from in the science is kind of contentious because that's two of the fall, two of the largest trees in that particular region falling over and laid side to side, side by side. Kind of weird, but that's where it comes from. Um, so essentially we got this set up. We're gonna go ahead and as an output feature class, I'm just gonna call it PC underscore buffer 150. My naming conventions are a little cryptic, but usually I try to have just some modifier that tells me what that is. Yes, sir. I accidentally closed my geoprocessing tab and now I can Great question. So if you, um, and I do this all the time, and I kind of have like a mild, you know, panic attack every time I do it, but if you close a geoprocessing tab or a catalog, if you go to the analysis tab at the top, the analysis tab at the top, at the top and you just click tools there, that's going to open up your geoprocessing tab. Uh, the same thing, if you close out your catalog, which happens to me, um, seriously hourly uh, the way that you can do that is underneath where are we? underneath view you can click on catalog catalog there that'll open it up inside of that uh, that this pane as well um, okay so for the distance um, excuse me the linear unit we're gonna have that as a linear unit keep that the same for the distance I'm gonna put that at 150 and then for this part that says unknown, I'm going to use feet there. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and use the planar method for that. And then um, all of you probably know about the dissolve kind of feature there. So if you wanted to, to, if you had like rings essentially around buffers around trees, for example, or walkability distance as being like a quarter of a mile, you could dissolve the lines of the overlapping buffers. Oh, so that's essentially what it what it'll do there. Um, I'm going to use dissolve all output features into a single feature. So it essentially, where you have overlaps, it'll erase those overlaps. That's kind of what that uh, tick will do. Let's go ahead and let's run that. And let's create a buffer for that particular stream. It'll update it and it creates kind of this. Uh, usually for demonstration, I'll just put that right on top and I'll change that. Uh, symbology again under properties i'll change that to kind of a red okay. and i'll hit apply and then also i'll change the appearance or the transparency so it shows up a little bit so i can see what's underneath also so kind of have that set up i probably went through that all too quick right no. okay Okay, so you have your buffer around the stream at 150 feet. Uh, the other cool thing, uh, sorry, my definition of cool is a little bit dated. It probably means that I need to get out more. But the other cool thing about this particular um, uh, buffer wizard that you can use, or buffer that you can use, is inside of GIS tools, if I say, okay, well, you know, recent data just popped up and it's now, I want to be, a state, I wanna be uh, safe, right? I want to not use just 150 feet, I want to use 200. So I can go back to that geoprocessing tool, I can go to 200 feet, and I can overwrite the shape file. I can now overwrite raster files inside of, um, inside of Dart Pro as well. Does anybody have like tons of data that you just no longer use and it's in a in cloud storage or it's like, you know, in a cabinet somewhere that's sitting on a hard drive and you're just like, crap, I might need that raster one day. You can overwrite it now. You can um, um, pretty much use that same name and it'll overwrite it with the program itself. So I can retrofit my data pretty easily. Um, that's something that's new and uh, interesting about Art Pro, the new Art Pro. So I can update that data to 200 feet instead of 150 by using just that same name. Does that make sense? 
clear as mud, clear as Paradise Creek. <laughs> um, okay, so we got that retrofitted, we got that sorted out. Uh, the next thing that we'll do is, let's see, we have the sorted out. Let's let's just show you um, if, for example, if you wanted to switch over to raster data for this, this particular project. Similar to if you're familiar with working with raster data, um, the way that you would do that is if I wanted to convert just the buffer into a raster format, and I wanted to run raster analysis, like an overlay analysis, and I wanted to have this assigned as a value of one and ag assigned as a value of one as well. And I wanted to add those two together to look for where the overlap is with my 100 foot buffer. So the way that I would do that is I'm going to use, I'm going to convert this polygon, this shape file, into a grid, into a raster file. So the way that you do that is similar to, um, for example, in um, an art map. So you'll go to analysis tab here, the analysis tab. And you'll click on environments. Remember, set your environments. Does anybody, has anybody familiar with doing that before with working with raster data? This is the quicker tab, the quicker way to set your environments. So if I click on environments here, I can tell it that I want it to go to my geo database. If I have scratch work, if I'm running like hydrology tools, for example, that scratch work, all of the ancillary data that you're for pre-processing, it's going to go to my scratch folder inside of the geo database as well. I can, I can show what that output, output coordinate is going to be. I'm going to use the same one for Paradise Creek. Um, so it's going to be that FIPS state plane. Uh, geographic transformations, don't worry about that one so much. The extent, what I'm going to use here, is I'm going to use a, um, another extent. I'm going to use the extent of the land use Moscow UIS. Okay. So that extent is going to be, and everybody's, are you familiar with the extent? That's, that's kind of the window of the project, right? That's where you want to run raster analysis. That's the bounds of what it's using. Uh, and then you also have snap raster. That's essentially the centroid of that, of every polygon to make sure those align. So two things that you want to have aligned with raster projects, your projection, and then also the central, the snap raster. Okay. Uh, so that's the center of every grid cell. Um, it's kind of outside of the scope of this workshop, but um, what you would do to set that is you'd go to on my extent. I have that set. I'll click on snap raster and I'll just double click on my Moscow folder. I don't have a raster right now inside of that, but that's completely fine. Um, I could just have this set to, to, to nothing right now and it'll, I'll show you what the extent will for the cell size, don't worry about that for right now. And then also for the mask under raster analysis, the mask will also control where you want that raster to grow, shrink or swell, if you're used to using like an expand tool. Like if you wanted to calculate population growth through like desymmetric mapping, uh, that's a way that you can do it with the mask outside of the scope of the workshop. But you wanna have, now we have that set for the extent and then also uh, for the geo database where it's gonna be working. So go ahead and hit OK there. The interesting thing about Art Pro is you can, I swear, I don't work for Art Pro. I don't work for Esri. I'm, you know, I'm not putting in plugs for them. I'm just psyched about it. Um, so the other thing that you can do with geoprocessing is you can convert this over to um, a raster pretty easy, easily. So we'll type in polygon to raster under conversion tools. And then we'll have our input feature. I'm going to use that PC buff 150, even though it's 200. And I forgot to change it. Um, I'll have the object field. Um, I'm just going to use the shape area. And instead of calling that like polygon to raster, kind of my shorthand for this is I just do underscore G for grid. That's, that's kind of personal preference of how you uh, like to f name your files. So that's the output raster data set. I just use underscore G for grid. Um, usually I'll use, like if I'm using read class file, I'll put in RE, uh, raster calculator, I'll put in RC. It's kind of the last tool that I used rather than the whole thing. Um, for the cell assignment, I'm gonna use cell center. That's the same thing as snap raster. It's the same thing as snap raster. Um, let's see, the priority field, I'm just gonna use none. 
for now. And the cell size, this is the other interesting thing, is you can set it through the tool with this, with this um, the newer version. So I'm just gonna put in uh, my grid cell size as a one, not as 30 meter data. I want something that's pretty specific. So I can set it here. I don't have to run through matching it with another grid, which is pretty interesting. So I'm gonna set that to one uh, grid cell size uh, for at one meter by one meter. Um, most land use land cover data, like for example, if you're using this, you probably all know this, but most of your data that you'll pull out from land cover data from MRLC for your national land use uh, land cover data is going to be a 30 by 30. Okay? It's rare if you find one by one. So you can actually create it here and you can run that to create a polygon for that particular uh, raster. Um, so that's going to build your attribute table. It's going to assign a value to it and it's also going to project what those particular um, grids are gonna look like. And then also, um, you know, just like with the older version, it takes a little bit of time to build the pyramids. You always have to have that running for if you're creating tins or anything that's uh, three dimensional. Everybody doing good? Anybody need a break or anything? Okay, because I know my voice can get pretty like, uh, just create that humming. I have a question about just the concept of this. So you, you buffered, and then you created the raster, and then the raster to grid, what is that? Can you explain that? Like the grid? Sure, sure. So, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right, no worries. So we'll kind of go back to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the hamburger. Um, so, my favorite GIS image. So you have all of these grids, right? Or different data types. You have vector data and also raster data. Um, think of these as like the grids as raster data. For each one of those pixels, uh, you can assign that with a value, one through whatever. You know? um, I'm going to give these today, I'm going to give those a value of one. Okay? I'm going to create another grid and also give that a value of one for all of the suitable locations for that group. Now, this, my students. It's always like, you know, they're, I don't know, they're, they're awesome in a lot of ways, but my favorite question to ask a bunch of college kids is, what's one, what's one? <laughs> There's like two, Dan. But you see how really confusing it gets. Whenever you have this grid, that specific cell, that's overlining with another grid, and you add one plus one, that's going to give you two for the output, right? So what if you have one through 17, you know, for a lot of all these different colors? you're gonna get some funky numbers, right, for the composite grid. So what I typically tell my students is um, use prime numbers because you can see the source, right? If it's a four, you know it's from a one and three. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's super complex. I lost you on that prime numbers. Huh. Um, so that's like, for example, if you had um, like a three and a five, if you have this this cell value at a three, right? Oh, so you set your base values at has prime numbers. You, yeah, you'll Not do that with a reclassify. And you have this value, a little bit I'm pointing at Hamburg, but you have this is a three, this is a five, right? And then whenever you add those two, if they overline, if they overlap each other, you have an eight in your composite, right? And then you still have in the other areas threes and fives, but you know, oh crap, it overlined over that, an eight and three and a five. So that highly suitable, that eight could be a place where you um, can have a landscape change, good or bad. That could be a, a suitable area for uh, development or a suitable area for mitigation or remediation. We'll do that with ag today. We'll just do that with one plus one. Okay? And that's not to be remedial. It's just to show you the utility of the tool. Um, does that make sense? So that's essentially raster analysis. That's that's typically how land people in development, land planners, and also remediation use raster analysis. Um, vector data is a little bit easier. Um, you can control just by select by attributes. Right? You're just going to select by attributes or select by location. Okay. So we got that um, clear as mud. Does everybody kind of get it a little bit? A little bit? Okay. Cool. Uh, so we have that set up. We have our grid created. And so we have our grid created. What we're going to do now is right click on that grid 
Okay. And you can see that it's showing up the, or it's demonstrating the values as a range uh, from 5.4 to, to so on. I don't necessarily want that. So I'm going to go to symbology. And instead of doing a stretch, I'm just going to go to uh, unique values there. And do you want to compute unique values? Go ahead and hit yes. Okay. And you see this number that pops up five billion four hundred and one you know so that's something that's been auto generated from that particular polygon um, I don't want that so there's a quick tool to fix that if I wanted to change this from five billion to one and that's going to be the reclassify tool has, it, has anybody used the reclassify tool before okay so what we'll do under geo processing is let's go to um, geo processing and let's type in reclassify Okay, so go ahead and click on reclassify there. I've got two. One has a 3D analyst tool and one has a spatial analyst. So use the spatial analyst. Um, you can use the 3D analyst. It's more or less the same, but I'm, I'm superstitious, so stick, stick with the, the spatial analyst. Good question. Thank you. Um, for the input raster, pick that grid. And then also for the value, I want to change all of these values to one, so it does it for you. You can see up here it'll say 5 billion and then it'll switch over just to one. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have that as a one. Let's leave that as a one for now. And then I'm just gonna run this again. I'm gonna rename that and I'll call it PC for Paradise Creek buff. Um, and then also RE for reclassify. That's my personal naming convention. You know, feel free to use what you'd like. And then I'll go ahead and hit run. Okay. Sure, sure. So once we have that set up, now you got your buffer that's created and reclassified here as a one. Okay. And that value is gonna be, um, for example, whenever you have that value set, what you can do there is add all of these together in terms of where they overlap with the value. And we'll run that in a second for re recalculating, or actually um, taking this value of one here. Uh, for, now, for now, go ahead and turn off all of your other layers. And then usually what I'll do is I'll bring in that value all the way to the top. Okay. And it takes a little bit of, of reload time. You can see the spinning wheel of death over here. And I have this, this value of one okay, as a top layer. I'm gonna create another one value, another map, another representation that's also at one. And I'm gonna add those ones together. Okay. Now, whenever I have those, I'm running suitability. I'm saying that if I have the layer that I produced earlier, agriculture, right? Also in a stream buffer, that means there's an area of concern, right? So that means that gives me, that tells me specifically a place that I need an intervention, a landscape intervention, construct a wetland, a biofilter, something like this. This is what we commonly use it for in landscape architecture. So I have that set up. Did, did that answer your question? So the 4 million that we started out with, Correct. Is there, they were 4 million individual Correct. separate ones. Now we just said each one is a one. Yep. Each one. So there was a range of values, like okay. a ton, you know, and we put those in just, just a one value. That's what the reclassify kind of button does. You can, you can set each of those individuals by selection to say, um, if there's a land cover type, I can switch that over to another value, like a 30, right? Um, um, or something like that. Um, that's the kind of thing is whenever you're running these tools, you want to make sure that you associate that value with some number that is based off of, um, you know, a value set from, from data, from research, from peer reviewed research, um, just to make sure it's credible. Kind of outside of the scope of this workshop, but we'll, um, um, if you're interested, uh, there's a LARC, uh, Landscape Architecture 395 course, where we kind of go through that uh, in like a semester long kind of process. 
Um, okay, so we have that set up. Let's go ahead and let's run that with raster calculator for the sake of time. Uh, before we do that, does everyone still have that Moscow Ag layer? Does everyone still have that one? Let's go ahead and then let's do the same pro process with that Moscow Ag layer. So what we'll do is first we'll take polygon to raster. as a conversion tool. Let's click on that. The input features are gonna be Moscow Ag. The value field will just be use type. Okay. And then also cell center, I'm gonna leave that. Priority field, none. I'm gonna set this again, the cell size, I want them to be consistent. So what cell size am I gonna use? Correct. I'll set that cell size to one and I'll hit run there. That's going to take a little bit of time to run that one. The cell size is one, one meter. meter. Yep, sorry, I didn't know. Uh, Say that. Um, so in each grid, you can tell it to do this, but each grid cell size is one meter by one meter. Okay. If I had 30 by 30, that's going to be 30 meters by 30 meters. Okay. So kind of the same thing popped up here for Moscow, and I, you know, I didn't reset the name, but that's fine for now. I'm gonna, the same thing is gonna pop up here. Um, under symbology, I'll right click on that. I'll go to symbology and I'll change that. Instead of a stretch, I'm gonna use unique values for that. That's gonna pop up as agriculture, as that cell size, or as that value. Um, once that finishes doing its thing, we'll open up the attribute table. <coughs> So um, that put it into just into one category. I'm gonna open up the attribute table and I can see because I did this with land use type, I have a value of one for this one. I don't have to rerun it, right? So it just converted it over to one value, okay? Let's open up the attribute table for PC buffer re. What's, what's that value for that one? One. What's, what is the count? You see that count there? That count is how many pixels there are, not acres. Not acres, that's how many pixels there are. Okay. Um, so that's, gonna, that's kind of also outside of the scope. So what we're gonna do now is, let's go ahead and let's collapse that uh, attribute table. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna add these two together to see where there's overlap. So if we look at kind of the uh, visual after spinning a little bit, Thing. We can see there's going to be overlap here and overlap there, but we want to be specific, incredibly specific, right, for this map. So we want to say exactly where that is. That's what raster analysis is for, is to give us a polygon of where specifically that is. So the way that we'll do that is underneath geoprocessing, I'm going to go to a new tool that we haven't used yet, but that's going to be called raster calculator. Raster calculator. Click on that. Okay. What we're going to do here is I'll select PC buffer. I'll double click that. Okay. I'll hit one space. And then I'll, for the operator, I'll click once on the plus sign. Oh, double click, excuse me, on the plus sign. And then I'll also click on MSC underscore ag for that. And, um, Sorry, go ahead and clear that. I, I, I said that wrong. Excuse me. And you can clear that with that clear expression, the, the eraser tool, you can clear that. Double click on PC um, buff RE. You don't have to hit the space. You don't have to hit the space. Double click on the plus sign and double click on miscellaneous, uh, or no, miscellaneous, Moscow Ag Polygon Raster. 
So you should have, you know, in quotes, that data, and then one space plus, and then another space. That SQL matters. That matters a lot. If you have one space in there, one missing character, it won't run it. Okay? So it also has to be in quotes. Um, this is. You check that and I'll you verify your SQL and our map here. Yeah, you can you can run the tool if it doesn't oh, okay. if it doesn't run then it doesn't work. Right. Um, but it's kind of clunky. But um, I'm just gonna call that. Um, let's see. Suit. Just for suitability. Okay. And I'll hit run. This is usually the point in, the wor in, in workshops where I like cross my fingers hoping that nothing's wrong. There's two things that they tell you in instruction. is uh, One, never ever teach a live tutorial workshop. <laughs> and the other is um, be loud enough to where everybody can hear you. I think I've botched both of those today. Okay, so anyway, let's go ahead and let's turn off, I'm gonna turn off all this other stuff. Okay. We have underneath there and then suitability the spinning wheel of death boom you have these two locations that are popping up okay. open up that attribute table <coughs> what's the value of that particular those sets of polygons one plus one equals two so this is kind of remedial for everybody. But imagine if you assign different weights to those, different values. You can come up with some pretty interesting stuff. I, I, like I said earlier, I prefer to use prime numbers so I can know where the origins come from. Um, cool, cool. So um, does, that, does that make sense for everyone? Yeah. So that's essentially your first raster analysis. So if you're, and what that means to you spatially, or in terms of the value that you just ran, is for example, where there's a bunch of agricultural runoff next to a stream, right, inside of a buffer. Now we know that this is an area where we need something like, you know, a bioswale. We need something like, for example, a treatment buffer to, to look at ag runoff. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Go ahead and uh, um, let's turn off those layers just for now. Let's talk about a, a little bit about layouts. And then kind of to follow up for the end, let's jump into 3D because I think everybody wants to look at what the arc scene value and how to play with that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so what you'll do here is let's talk a little bit about layouts. So let's go to the insert tab. Let's go to the insert tab. And then go to new layout. Click on new layout. Okay. Underneath the new layout, I'm gonna use a 24 by 36, that's typical uh, kind of standard print, uh, print size, or architectural D. So that's gonna be under architectural landscape, and that's gonna be arc D. Okay. Click on that, and that's gonna create a new layout here, a new layout tab. I can move that thing around, I can put that up here at the top if I want, I can leave it at the bottom, it's whatever you prefer. Um, that's gonna make it easier for you to, uh, to kind of move around or navigate inside of art. I'm gonna close or collapse my, my attribute table so it's not taking up a lot of the space for this artboard. So in terms of what this yeah. is or what we're doing, we're, we have model space, right? And we have layout space. We have, this is an artboard. This is an actual piece of paper. So if you view it that way, that's one way to look at it. So what we'll do now is we're gonna create a new frame so underneath this one, right next to the toolbox, you have new frame. I'll click on that, and that's gonna produce that same app. I can resize that, change that, um, and also change the scale if I wanted to there. Um, and it's just showing that particular uh, data that I produced earlier. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna go to map, okay? And I'll just use the, lot, uh, the land use Moscow UIS, okay? I'm just gonna display that one. Land use Moscow UIF, and I'll go back to layout. So if you're doing, is everybody looking at the world view? Is everybody looking at that? Probably. You, you added something there that. Uh, oh, 
oh, let's let, let me just redo all of that actually. Okay, so we, we're looking at our map view. I'm just gonna close out my tab, my layout tab. I'm just gonna do that whole thing over again. So I got the map showing up here, and also have the catalog pane. Okay. Um, what I'll do here is I'll do an insert, okay, and I'll do new layout there. I'm gonna do architectural D. I'll click that, and that's gonna pop up with this one that here. Okay, with that particular layout, or this artboard as it's called in other programs. And then and now I'm underneath this, I'm gonna go to map frame, okay? And I'm gonna go to the bottom here. Now I can do a default, or I can also tell it how big I want this to be, right? Um, for now, I'm just gonna use, I'm gonna click the top just to say um, I want it to be the extent of the page. So you kind of have the bottom window and the top. That's another thing in the newer version, it'll say if you want this to be a, um, a rectangle, if you want this to be a circle, something like that in the newer in version 2.2. Um, in this one, I can just say I want it to be a rectangle and I'm gonna go to this leader at the end, okay? And now I'm gonna start to change that size of that particular extent here. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab that and move it over. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Everybody with me? You, some of you, it looks like some of you are seeing like the world or the globe on that. So that's completely fine. Um, if that's happening, you'll go to, ah, excuse me, the layout tab, the obvious place where it is, the layout tab, okay? And then go to activate. Has anybody worked with data frames before? Maybe a little bit, it's the same way that you'd activate a data frame. So I'll go to layout, this layout tab, go to activate there, okay? And now this will pop up. You see this, this shortcut here? So now I can zoom in and out for a particular space. I can zoom into Moscow, right, For that at that scale. Sure, sure, let me go back a little bit. So, get out of this. Um, okay, so now I have this set. I'm just gonna change the artboard size to kind of show you guys utility. Okay, so it's out of scale. I wanna scale this down to something where that site's inside of my particular unit. So what I'll do is I'll go to the layout tab up top here. Layout. And then underneath this, I'm gonna go to activate. The layout tab at the top. I'll click on activate. And now I can zoom in to a particular scale to where the, the extent of the project is showing up. I can click, um, I can use the roll, uh, the roll kind of command on the mouse to, to roll in and out or scale in and out. And I can also hold down left click to change or pan where I want that to be. Okay. Um, the other thing that I typically like to suggest for people to use is also make sure your units are, um, are something that's like a nominal unit. Don't use one unit to 6,573, use 6,500, right? So at this bottom here, at the bottom here, you can actually click on that and change it, right? You can go back to 6,500 and just type in that there and hit enter, and that'll put it right at 6,500. Does that make sense? Um, I can also scale that down. I can change that to whatever I want it to be. I can also change that to 7,000 units and hit enter, and that's going to put it at one inch equals 7,000. Really quick, um, easy way to do this. Okay, so I'm going to um, click out of the layout tab up here at the top. Okay, so I'll go to close activated map frame. Okay. So I can do that. or I can do it up here. It's kind of whatever you prefer. Inside of layout. Oh, I take that back. Inside of insert, the insert tab at the top. You have all this um, information, supplemental information that can help uh, with that map. You have a north arrow, which you can drag in there just by clicking on it and then actually drawing that out. Change the size, for example way too huge, so I'm gonna scale, scale that down. Um, again, that's gonna, just like with ArcMap, that's gonna retrofit to the orientation that you're using in, in, your, in your viewport. Um, so the other thing is with the scale bar, I can click on that and then set what that scale bar is gonna be here. Um, I can click on the bottom part of it to pick which scale bar I want, so I prefer this one, so I'm gonna use that one. 
Okay. And I can bring that all the way here to the bottom. That scale bar, again, that's going to retrofit to your units that you're using for that particular projection. And then also the legend. The legend is a lot easier than it was in our, our uh, uh, excuse me, arc map. You click on that and then draw it out here to the right to put that in. Okay. So all too quick way to put this into, uh, into a layout. Um, the other question that's, it's kind of a different thing than, um, than what art map. Does anybody use Illustrator in here for vector data? Usually what I put, the, my process that I prefer to do is how I'll create my layout and then I'll bring it into Illustrator. That's kind of clunky with art map, okay? So the way that you do it as an output is you'll go to share here at the top. Okay. And up here you'll go to layout. And then you export as a PDF, okay? And you can export, change the resolution to dots per square inch. I usually use 300, 300 is kind of the standard. Um, and then, you know, have that as a best quality image. So I'll put that at 300, and now I can export. Don't do that for now, that takes a lot of time for rendering. Uh, hold off on doing that, I don't wanna clunk up your machines for right now. But that's one way that you'll export out. You can, you can open up that PDF file, and Illustrator if you're familiar with Illustrator and you want to use that. Okay, so that's essentially layouts. Um, yes? Have we changed the font size of legends? So you can do that from, if you right click on that box, it, you'll, it'll give you a capability. Third property. Okay, so you got that saved. You got your map. Let's go back to the map view and I want to show you one other tool. So we've kind of covered layouts. Let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Kind of like in Monty Python, like it's time for something different, right? So um, let's look at the green infrastructure um, component of the Living Atlas. I want to show you the utility of the Living Atlas real quick. Uh, and this is really cool stuff in terms of how to put in this live data into your project. So instead of like data mining and pulling data from this, there's a live data set that's being updated constantly. Um, RGIS and Esri has um, kind of, it, some of it is contentious to make sure that it is peer reviewed before it goes, if that it's not Wikipedia kind of data, right? So it is contentious uh, and it's still working through a lot of kinks and filters to make sure it is reputable and peer reviewed data. Uh, but I, in my opinion, I think this is kind of the future of this program and data itself or big data and how to handle all of this, and put it into one, one funnel. Um, so what that looks like is go to the catalog tab here and then go to the top where it says portal and click on that. Um, so you'll see my content. This is, um, right now I'm, I'm signed in. This is all my content that I have on Arc Online. If you're familiar with Arc Online, you can, it's cloud storage that you can store files and also run a few tools. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use, um, instead of portal for my content, I'm gonna go over here all the way to the right to Living Atlas. I'm gonna go all the way to the right to Living Atlas. Here I'm gonna type in green infrastructure. And this is the true definition of uh, green infrastructure in terms of, um, I think I think it's actually from E.O. Wilson, give half back, kind of a, a landscape ecologist. Um, but it's the truest sense of, of, of our the first definition of green infrastructure for habitat. Okay. Um, and essentially what this is, is a massive worldwide, uh, excuse me, US-wide, hopefully in the next couple of years, worldwide green infrastructure data set. Uh, so go to habitat fragments there. Habitat fragments. Take that, right click on that habitat fragments and go to add to current map. So that is 30 by 30 meter data, right? If you look, it looks a little sawtoothy, but that's essentially 30 by 30 meter data of all of the habit fragmented habitat types for uh, all across the United States. Okay. So if you zoom out to the US scale, 
that's all the green infrastructure in the sense of habitat uh, for the contiguous U.S. and I believe Alaska too. Um, let's see. So pretty interesting stuff. I mean, this is really useful in terms of no, not Alaska. That would be a cool one to, to see. But that's the future, in my opinion, of GIS of um, you know using this type of suitability uh, to have that running for a particular project. Incredibly useful. Incredibly useful data. Um, and you can see there, it's already been weighted. So it's a one and a zero. Does everybody see that as a grid? So everything is a, a value of one. You can reclassify that and make it a higher value. You can put that in a 30, right? Because it's very, very valuable or something like this. And put that into a suitability map. Um, so everybody kind of see that? Okay. Cool. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left. Is, is everybody okay with time? Does everybody need to be out of here by... By 12.30, okay, so let's go, if it's okay with your permission, I was thinking of going five minutes over just to talk about 3D. I really wanna show you how, how easy this is to, to put that inside of a project. Um, so what we'll do is I'm gonna go back to my study area here. Okay, I'm gonna go to these, um, these particular UF, um, excuse me, UIS. I'm gonna put that at the top. I'm gonna put that all the way at the top here. All right, so I got this set. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna convert this over to a 3D. Oh, and you can turn off the green infrastructure if you want. It um, doesn't mean that it's not important, but uh, you can turn it off for now. So go to view, okay. And then underneath, underneath view, you'll see convert. Click on convert. Okay. So now that's converting it over to a 3D image. Okay. And that, that's going to take a little bit of time. Okay. It's still going to show up as a flat image and you can orbit essentially around that in a second. Okay. So I'm going to switch over to local here. Switch over to local and that tab on the left. Okay. And then I'm gonna hold down on the scroll uh, and then select this one. This is kind of a little funky to navigate around. Where is that local? What's it? Oh, so you'll see all the way on the left, all over on local, it's kind of there. And then now I can pan and if I right click, Oh, man. So let me do it. Hang on one second. Sorry for that. It's, the, the version on my machine lets me do this pretty easily. Oh, you click the center wheel on the mouse. Oh, yeah. Why does it not let me do it? Is that it? Oh, yeah. So it's this one, right? No. Man, it's still not doing what I wanted it to do. I'm oh, sorry for that, guys. What, what I'm doing is I'm uh, pressing down on my roller and then rotating my, my mm. mouse on the table. Th that's usually how it works on my machine. But I don't yeah, know. that's what it's doing. Okay, but everybody's able to rotate? Okay, cool. Some people are doing it. <laughs> sorry for the people that are in that
So, sorry, this is a, a version thing that's kind of. Man. Okay, there we go. At least it's a little bit of doing it. Kind of clunky. Sorry for that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so get 2.2. <laughs> it's a lot easier. You just click on the, on the wheel and you can navigate like this. So with this one, and I can't believe I just figured this out, but, but with your help, with all of your help, um, you can click on these particular rings, the center ring, um, and that would help you to navigate around the drawing. Okay? I think once you have that selected, then you can pan. Um, and then, yeah, right click is not letting me orbit either. But now I can kind of go to a particular area. Okay, so let's just use an orthogonal view for now. I'm just gonna use this one. Um, let's go ahead and let's set the environments for this. So what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and I wanna change that particular uh, base map because the dark is uh, not really doing it for this one, for a 3D view. So let's go to the base map. And I'm gonna change this just to street. It's going to take a little bit of time to update. Okay. So that's a little bit more illustrative of what we're dealing with in this particular geography. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and let's um, look at the appearance showing up there. Um, right click on that map 3D layer and then go to properties. Underneath the properties, go to illumination, and you can also change um, the lat and the long of where you want the sun position. Okay, so that's a quick way to do it. You can also change the date and the time of where you have the sun. So right now it's set to um, today at 12:30. I want to do kind of a 6 p.m. I want to see what that looks like. So I'm just going to delete that and put a 06. That may vary based on what 30 you don't have a date and time? <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'll apologize uh, for that. Um, but you can change the date and the time. You can also change the altitude. Uh, that's another way to do it. Um, but, but if you can't, you just know that it, it does exist, that you can change those parameters. Okay, so I kind of have the 6 p.m. kind of thing set up. Go back to your art catalog and go to the project here. Let's bring in some buildings. Let's bring in some buildings. Let's add some elevation to this. Okay. So underneath that, let's go ahead and let's go to our building layer. Um, I'm gonna use the 2011 Moscow UIS, and I'm just gonna right click and go to add to current map, or you can drag that in, it's whatever you prefer. Okay. So that's gonna pull it up in your, in your data, that's gonna pull it up in your representation. And it, it's probably not showing up, is, is it showing up for anybody? Yeah. Okay, cool. So at least that's consistent. So that means that it's at a ground. It's at, at ground zero. We want to put that, pull that up to the uh, at the ground level to sit on top of that extruded area on that on top of that vertical exaggeration. So what we'll do is we'll right click there on that layer that you just brought in. You'll go to properties and then click on elevation. You can set that one to on the ground from that top tab. It says features are at an absolute height. Go ahead and set that to on the ground. Okay. And let's use an okay there. Your building should show up after you. Everybody see that? What's wrong with these buildings though? Pretty flat. Man. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's fix that. Um, we need data though. We need to have associated data for building height. Um, there's another uh, site that I failed to mention up here. There's open street map data, and some of that has um, uh, building heights associated with it. For now, let's just call it at about uh, two stories. So let's make all of these buildings in that particular layer two stories. So what I'll do is I'll right click on my building uh, um, UIS layer, and I'll go to attribute table, 
Okay. Let's add in a new column here, a new field. I'll go to add field. And I'm just going to call this height, H-I-G-H-T. I'll set this to numeric. Okay. And then at the top, I'll just go to save up here. I'll just go to save. Okay, so I'll go back. I'm going to close out this this 3D tab here. Okay. I'm going to go back to my new height, um, my new height category here. I'll right click, and I'll go to calculate field. Right click at the on the height tab. And I'll go to calculate field. And then here for the height, I'll just type in 20. I'll type in 20. And I'll hit run. Okay, so now everything is at 20. Everything is at 20 feet. Um, did you miss that one? Um, so. Right here. Okay. Okay, we got that sorted. Now, okay. So now you'll go to appearance. Go to appearance there. And with that layer selected, you'll go to type. Okay. And for the type, do maximum height. Maximum height. Set that to that particular height attribute table, to that particular attribute here. And that's gonna put a, a synthetic height on these buildings at 20 feet. Okay? So you'll change this type to maximum height and change this category to height there for the attribute. Everybody see that? Oh, so, so kind of one more time. You'll change this one, this type underneath the appearance tab. Set that to max height. For extrusion and then underneath this one underneath this drag down category you'll go to height there and you can change uh, this particular point does everybody kind of see that no yeah. okay cool so that's essentially a quick way to make a 3d view of course if you had associated data um, with from open street map for specific buildings, now you can go ahead and change that. Um, you can also change underneath that particular um, layer for the open street map, you can change the vertical exaggeration. So underneath properties, um, you can, oh, excuse me. That's another version thing, but there's, I'm sure with even with this version, there's a way to change the vertical exaggeration. So if you wanted to make this look like Mordor, right? Um, you can change it underneath that. Um, it's another version thing, but there's a few tutorials that if anyone's interested, I can I can send your way with the newer version of how to do it. Really quick, really easy way to change. So similar to Google Earth. Yep. You can change that. And set it, right now it's like one to one, but you can put it at one point two five and bring it up. Um, I use I use this trick for histograms for three D histograms quite a, quite a, a lot. Like it, right now we have a project in Magic Valley which we're showing in the future, what would it, what it would look like, what the landscape would look like with increased um, CAFO cattle counts for, you know, how that's going to impact the contiguous landscape. So we use histograms for this and we'll make those CAFOs like 20 feet tall, right? And then some of them will make like, you know, a thousand feet tall if it's an increased number. Sort of like to show it as a graph, as a visual display of, of impact. Um, Cool. So I think I can't believe I went all over over all of that within a two hour session. Good God, that's almost a semester's worth of work. But um, thank you so much for bearing with me. Apologies for a lot of the snafus that popped up. But um, I think everybody picked up a you know your search by attributes. We didn't cover search by location. Um, raster analysis, converting over some basic raster tools, and then also a little bit of three D and um, also the uh, the living atlas. Um, so I think I think we're we're on board about how to use Pro. Does everybody feel a little bit confident with using Pro nowadays? Or after this session?
you know, feel, feel at least capable to open it up and to jump in. I just had a question regarding this layout view. Is that a whole separate file as opposed to our map or would that internal to the map file? So this is whatever you save, one, whenever you, good question. Whenever you go to project, excuse me, save as, it's going to save that whole geo database. All of your projections, all of your 3D maps, all of your uh, layouts too, in one folder, one geo database. Um, if you have that on a remote ser server, you can access it anywhere on the planet. Uh, it's pretty cool. The other thing is, um, if if you wanted to export this particular view, okay, you'll go under share, and you can export through share through the map. That's going to have this graphic as a PDF file or even a JPEG if you want something lighter. That's all under the share tab. Is how you kind of print out all the stuff. So you can do multiple layouts per map as opposed to our map where there's one layout per. Yep. So if I, if I show you a project that I'm working on now, I think I got 30, 30 different layouts and then like 30 different map tabs. It takes so about multiple maps within the same project. Yep. Whereas our map is a separate map, separate files. Yeah. Okay. Separate, like, like you'd have to open up Arc Math four or five yeah. times. With this, I mean, it's all in one container. It's a really efficient, really useful way to go through. Um, any any other questions that you guys can think of? Was was this useful for anyone? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Well, that's good to hear. Um, let me know if you have any questions um, after the session, and then also if you have, um, I can send out this link to of what these particular sites are if anybody's interested in that. Um, cool. I think thank you, Bruce, and then also the help from our, our libraries for putting this on. This has been really useful for us. Um, any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming out. And happy Halloween. Um, Bruce, did you want to add anything? Uh, I don't think so. I guess one thing I'd say is if you're an Arc Map user, uh, Pro, you can install side by side with Arc Map, so you know they're not mutually exclusive there. Um, and uh, the other thing with the updates, if you're a traditional Arc Map user, we had to uninstall and reinstall. Uh, this will alert you when your update, so you can install right on top of here, so you don't have to uninstall like you did in Arc Map. Um, and then additionally, maybe just sharing these, you can certainly share them as items on ArcGIS Online or other applications to access, like if you're using data collection with, you know, Collector or if you're using some other online application, kind of Esri Sphere, that you can get these data and all that. So, hi. How are you guys? Pretty good. How are you doing? We're, we're just wrapping up. No, that's okay. Um, you guys can stay, okay? <laughs> I'm not here to disrupt whatever you're doing. Just want to make sure that you're doing a thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can keep doing your thing, okay? <laughs> My kids will be very happy. <laughs> okay. Cool. So I think we're, um, if there aren't any other questions, just, just to comment on that point, it, that kind of lives here. If you wanted to share that as a web layer, you'd right click, go to properties, share as a web layer. You can also share as a map package. So, for example, you can send people emailable links of that particular geo database. You share a map without them being able to pull data off it. So, if you want to send them a finished map, though, then maybe they can add stuff that they can't pull your own data off. That's called a map layer set, I believe. Okay. So, so that's that is possible. Yep, definitely. I know there's some concern with putting stuff online with certain, certain data. Permissions. You can do that through Arc, um, Arc Online too. You can set those permissions to say everyone has access, or just you Idaho employees. Uh, or some can edit, some can just read only. You can import Arc Map right to this pretty easily. Arc Map Maps. Yep. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, guys. You can import layers from ArcGIS Online, or they can add maps. it. The whole maps are in online. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann. Oh, I'm Dan. Nice to meet you. Are you using, do you use AutoCAD and RJS to go back and forth? Definitely. Um, so there's a tool through geoprocessing, and I think it's just um, Map to CAD tool. Map to CAD or uh, fe uh, Features to CAD. Okay. And you can export these those particular layers. Um, like if it's a vector tool, I mean, excuse me, if it's a vector layer, that's kind of the way that you process it. 
Okay. Here's what I'm, I'm stepping into somebody else's 